Movement Church fam, so, so sad that we're not with you right now because I know that you've had an amazing morning of worship already. But this morning, you are in for a real treat. We've got a good friend of ours, Pastor Natasha Lambert, preaching, and she is going to bring a word all weekend long. She's been speaking to our young people at Overflow, and I know she's fired up. If she still has a voice, it's going to be worth listening to. Now, listen, Natasha and her husband planted a church called Experience Church just 10 years ago in Calgary. And they have seen God do amazing things. That church has exploded. It's had multiple campuses. It's multiple experiences. Just this past Easter, they took over a theater called The Jack and packed it out with 2,500 people worshiping Jesus and celebrating his resurrection. Would you do me a favor? Would you give a big round of applause for my good friend, Pastor Natasha? Hey, hey, everybody. Good morning. Oh, man, you got to do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that feels good. We were at uh, Overflow, me and these amazing students here that you have, and it was loud. It was loud. I don't know. There's a bit of a ringing in my ear this morning still, and uh, Pastor Jeff is right. My voice is a little weaker than normal, but that's okay. I'm so glad to be with you today, um, all the way from Calgary, the promised land, um, where the mountains are. Guys, it's so amazing. But you know what? Ontario has been showing up this weekend. This is pretty amazing weather. I'm okay. May, this is good May weather. There, there is always a chance that we're going to get snow still in May in Calgary. So I will take the sunshine any day. I, we love your pastors, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Amber. What an honor and a privilege to be here this Sunday. And uh, I got to hang out with Pastor Amber all weekend. She was our host at Overflow. And they're just the best, aren't they? Yes, they are the best. And can I say something? The best way that you can continue to honor your lead pastors is by getting in on the action. And what I mean by that is if you've been sitting on the sidelines, uh, you got to get in the game. Being a, a follower of Jesus and being part of the body of Christ is not a spectator sport. There's no, um, there's no bleachers in the kingdom. You got to get on the field. And so that means serving and giving and leading groups and being a part of what God is doing here. Because if we're going to reach this city, we're going to need everybody. Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay, let's turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. I'm going to read from chapter 4, then I'm going to read from chapter 5, and we're going to unpack it. It has a few names in here that I'm going to mispronounce, so just bear with me. Genesis 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 19. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the first one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I have to say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Flip over to Genesis 5, verse 25. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years. How many are glad that we don't live to be 969 anymore? Methuselah, the longest living man on the planet, and then he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Genesis 4, we have a, a man named Lamech. Genesis 5, we have a man named Lamech. But they are two different guys. 
This is why it's important to study the Bible, not just read the Bible. Get into a group that's going to study the Bible. Get into some good theological courses. Get into some good teaching to study the Bible, or else you would read this man's name and think it was the same guy. Well, in fact, it's two guys. And why is this important? Well, they come from two separate lines. One comes from the line of Cain. You may remember Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve's first two sons. And the second Lamech comes from the line of Seth. Seth was the son that was given as compensation. The Lord blessed Eve with another son because her son Abel had been killed. One line, the line of Cain ends in destruction. The line of Seth lines, uh, goes towards deliverance and Life everlasting. Seth's line is the line that lasted when the flood came. Let's pray together. God, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to be here at Movement today. God, I thank you that your presence is here, that you are alive, that you are on the throne, and that we can go to your word to learn from you, even in the Old Testament. And so, God, I pray that today that you would speak to our hearts, that we would wrestle out this word, we take from it what we need to take so that we could walk out these doors changed today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, in 2007, uh, my husband and I, we were um, on staff at a church in Vancouver, and we took a team of students um, over to Europe. We were in Poland, in Prague, in London, England, and we were doing a missions trip that looked a little bit different. We were um, overseeing a band. We were musicians, we were going to lead worship in some churches, and then we were doing concerts, cover cover songs in some high schools, and then preaching the gospel. It was awesome. And we had this group of 15 and 16-year-olds with us. And now that I have a 15-year-old, I would never have sent my 15-year-old with me and my husband back then. I'm like, what were those parents thinking? And so we're over in Europe, uh, loving life, doing all the things. And um, I don't know if you can remember, students, you probably know that when you uh, do something for the first time without your parents around, you kind of make dumb decisions. And so like maybe it's like the first time you have a sleepover, you pull an all-nighter or you do something and 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 you end up paying for it the next day. You ate way too much junk food, or my husband used to eat Fast Eddie's. I saw that there's one around here. Uh, when he, he lived out in Ontario, I'm like, that is so disgusting. Um, but hey, that's not against Fast Eddie's. If you're all about the cheap burgers, go for it. Uh, but you make bad decisions when your parents aren't around. We had this one guy on our team, he was a drummer, he's 15 years old, and he made a ton of bad decisions because his parents weren't around, and little did we know he had a lot of dietary allergies. So we're on this trip, and he's eating all of these things that are not doing so well in his stomach, and we have to like get him to a washroom in the middle of Europe, and, and so we're always keeping our eye on this guy because he's, he's just going to go rogue. He's going to do something, he's going to make a de bad decision, and sure enough, we're in London, England. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's kind of a big city. It's kind of a big deal. Nearly 10 million people. We are walking Leicester Square in the subway stations. I don't know if you've uh, been on their subway, on the tube. It's just like layer upon layer into the bowels of London. There's 272 different train stations, uh, 11 different train lines going all over the city. It's mayhem. It, it's like it, massive anxiety for me leading a team of students in such a place. And so our drummer, he's so ambitious. He's just an adventurer. He gets out in front of us, and he thinks he knows where he's going. Little does he know. He has no clue. And he hops on a train, and the doors shut, and we're on this side. <laughs> waving. And he's gone. Ten million people. In Leicester Square, there's the Piccadilly line and the Northern line, and they cross, and he jumps on a train and a line, and we have no idea where he's going. It's 2007. We don't have cell phones. There's no way to track him, and he's gone. We're just thinking we're going to lose our jobs. This is it. We're done. We're just going to stay here and not come home. Luckily enough, we figured it out. We found him on the next train stop, and all was good. But I want to show you today here in Genesis that there are two different lines, and it matters which line you're on. 
Genesis 4 and Genesis 5 show us the line of Cain and the line of Seth. The line of Cain is the line of rebellion and sin and poor decisions. And it ultimately ends in destruction. The line of Seth is a line that acknowledges the Lord of worship, heart full of gratitude. It's not a line that's perfect, but it's a line that's in pursuit of God. The Bible is full of family lines. I don't know if you do the, like, read through the Bible. I know that once I get to the genealogies, I'm like, okay, okay. I just skim to see if my name's in there, and if it's not, then I skip over it. If you want to know, Natasha is not in the Bible. But I, I, I skip over the lines because I, I don't know how to pronounce them. I don't, I don't really care. What does this even mean to me? Great, this person had this kid, this person had this kid. So what? But for some reason, the writer of Genesis, which was Moses years later, decided, hey, I'm going to put these two lines in here because it's important. So we want to look today at how and maybe why did Cain's line go so wrong. We're going to look at Cain's Lamech as our case study. And so the number one thing I want to show us today is that in Cain's line, they ignored God's design. Ignored God's design. Cain's Lamech was an evil man who had no issue with violating God's plans. He was famous for being the father of polygamy. He was the first in the Bible to marry not one wife, but two. And there would have been about 1,500 years from Adam to Lamech, so he certainly would have known what was required of him. He knew what was appropriate and what wasn't. And against God's ordained purpose for marriage, one man with one woman, in the Garden of Eden, as he has it outlined, Lamech just does whatever he wants to do. He lives however he wants, pursuing his own desires. See, when Cain and Abel in Genesis were asked to bring an offering before the Lord, Cain brings a sacrifice that's non acceptable to the Lord because he doesn't bring his first and his best. Abel brings his first and his best. Cain just brings some. And so it was an offering that wasn't in line with God's design. And so by doing so, it removed Cain from the blessing of God. Because he didn't follow God's design, he came out from underneath God's blessing. Like you and I, if we choose to operate outside of God's design, guess what happens? We are removed from underneath God's blessing. He can't bless what we're doing on our own. If we choose to do it out of his design, he's not going to honor that. If you choose to do your relationship outside of God's design, well, you are removing yourself from underneath God's blessing. If you choose to do your finances or parenting or, or live your life or maybe run your business outside of God's design, you're removing yourself from without, with under God's blessing. We think, well, that's, you know, that standard right there, that doesn't really apply to me. You know, I've been doing the God thing for a while. Him and I kind of have a deal sorted out. I've been through a lot. Maybe, maybe I've, hurt, I've been hurt in a past relationship, and so I, I thought doing it God's design was a good way, but it turned out to hurt me, and it turned out to be painful and maybe not beneficial, and so I've chosen to just kind of make a deal with God that I've got my own thing going on, and I, I can kind of live over here in my own standard. But since when is there a different standard for different people? Since never. Just to clarify, God's standard is God's design, and it's made there for each and every one of us. Our culture today has no respect and no honor for God's design. We can see it. It's obvious. There's a complete disdain of God's design. God's design is on the hot seat. It's on social media. It's in politics. It's in education. It's probably in your workplace. It might even be around your dinner table. God's design is... It's not favorable. God's design for marriage, relationships, business, parenting, money. People don't like God's design. People don't like God's best plan for humanity. We don't like God's ways. Because in society and culture, we believe that our opinion and our feelings trump truth. What? Well, this is how I feel, so this must be right. My opinion of this, well, it, it, this trumps truth. There's no absolute truth. 
Absolute truth doesn't even exist. You can have your truth, and I'll have my truth. And as long as we respect each other and stay out of each other's business, we can live together. Can you imagine what that would look like on the road driving? If I said, well, a red light to me means go. I don't know what you were doing, but I was going. It would be mayhem. It would be chaos. But our world is living in such a way that there's no acknowledgement for absolute truth. Our world says that God is bad and we are good. Doing things God's way is bad. We can figure this out on our own. Can I just say this though? God's design might be in the hot seat, but God's not feeling the pressure. God's design might not be popular in your workplace or in your school or at home, but he's not going to succumb to the critics. He's not worried and he's not anxious. So neither should you and I be. And to be honest, for all the believers in the room, you kind of have to get ready, kind of have to be willing for people not to like you. And as a people pleaser, it's the hardest thing. We want to keep the peace. As Canadians, it's the hardest thing. We don't want to offend anybody. But in Matthew 10, verse 21, Jesus says, Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his children, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Nobody wants to talk about how much we're going to be hated. I don't want to be hated. I don't want to be extra hated, so I'm not going to go and just purposely ruffle feathers. That's not the point. But if you live a life of conviction, if you live a life that honors God with your sexuality and your purity and your, your business and your parenting and your marriage, if you're going to stay committed, if you're going to love God and follow, if you're going to show up on Sunday and bring your kids to church on the regular, the world doesn't get it. They don't understand, and they won't like it, and they won't like you. But Cain's line, Cain's line ignored God's design. Secondly, Cain's line dismissed God's judgment. Not only does Lamech take two women to be his wives, he flaunts it. He's the first person in Scripture to openly endorse sin. The text that I read in Genesis 4 is actually a song. They call it the song of the sword. And he is flaunting his sin. He says, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. This is a song. He's celebrating it. And we see how sin evolves from generation to generation when we look at Genesis. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they felt guilt and they felt shame. And in turn, they went to blame. So Adam blames Eve and Eve blames the serpent. So they, they feel bad for their sin. Cain, who kills his brother Abel, Although it was completely wicked and evil, he demonstrates his disapproval for sin when he tries to cover it up and lie to God. When God says, hey, Cain, where's your brother? He says, I don't know. Am I a brother's keeper? But Lamech, a few generations down the line, Lamech, he makes no attempt to hide his sin. He feels no guilt. He feels no shame. In fact, he promotes it. He flaunts it. He brags about it. He tells everybody about it. He's like there taking a selfie with his two wives and the guy he just killed going, look at me, everybody. Look what I did. And wanting all of his friends and family to like it. Would like my post. Look at what I'm doing. I can't. I, I don't know, guys. I don't know about you. But I can't like a post when I know that you know that you're doing something with somebody somewhere that you know you're not supposed to be doing. I'm not going to like that post because it's promoting sin. It's flaunting sin. When you know better, this kind of pride and arrogance reveals someone that who has placed their standards above God's. Well, I know better than God. 
Lamech not only violated God's design for marriage, but he was violent. He was vengeful. He had anger like Cain. And he took his sins to another level. Lamech recites his deeds to his wives. He's trying to assure them and assure himself that if God gave mercy to Cain, he will give mercy to me. He says, if Cain will be avenged sevenfold, then I'll be avenged 77-fold, assuming that his sin would go unpunished. In total arrogance, Lamech presumes upon the mercy and the kindness of God, viewing it as a free pass for evil. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 says, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his judgment, righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give each person according to what they have done. This is a text about judgment. See, God's grace that he chooses to extend to you and I is not deserved. If we get to a place and we think that we deserve God, God's grace, that's dangerous territory. But the grace that God extends to you and I, we can't take advantage of it. And if you're doing number one, if you are ignoring God's design, then guess what? You're definitely doing number two. You're dismissing his judgment. If you are ignoring God's design, you are dismissing his judgment. Oh, it's not a big deal. God will forgive me. I mean, have you, have you seen their Instagram, have you seen their life? If they show up to church, I'm good. I, I got nothing to worry about. But we think that we know what's best. God was merciful of Cain. Said he would protect him, but you don't play around with mercy. Because there is an awe and a holiness of God that we need to get back to. When you show up on a Sunday, this is a holy place. This is holy ground. When you're in your car and you're worshiping the Lord on your way to work, that's a holy place. That's a holy, that's holy ground. God's worthy of our worship and our praise because he is sovereign and he is all powerful and he is all knowing and he is holy. And I need to be in awe of that, that God, you would be okay with me coming and being in your presence, that I could live, that you would give me another breath and you would give me another day and everything that I have and everything that, that I get to be a part of on earth right now is only because of your grace. There's a holiness and an awe. There is, there is such a thing as a holy fear of God. A holy fear of God because God is the one true judge. He can judge the thoughts and the motives and the intentions and the actions. We, we judge each other's actions, but only God knows what's actually going on in our hearts. Only he knows my motives and my intentions. And Lamech thinks he's got God figured out, that his sin isn't any different than Cain's sin. And if God extended grace to Cain, then, then he's going to extend grace to me, and I'm going to turn out fine. I got this. And unfortunately, the Lamech in Cain's line ends in destruction. Both Seth and Cain come from the same parents. They both come from Adam and Eve. I don't know if this is like this in your house, but you kind of look around sometimes and you're like, man, we're all of, I have four kids. They all came from us, but that one is a little bit different. <laughs> where, where, did, where did that, I'm not going to tell you who, where did that one come from? I, I, if you ever think, I also like to blame every bad thing in my kids on my husband and say that they got it from him. And, and so, like, I, at my house, they, there's, they just take their socks off as soon as they get in the house. And they leave them all over the place. I don't know if this happens to you. There's socks on the kitchen table, socks on the counter, socks in the stairs. There's no socks in the laundry basket. And nobody can find socks when they need socks. It's so weird. In our house, when you're pouring something and you spill, they slurp it off the counter. 
and I didn't teach them that. <laughs> Same parents, two different lines. So how do we get on the right line? This is what's important today. Well, I think we overcomplicate it. Genesis chapter 4, verse 26 says, Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. At what time? At the time that Seth had a child. Sometimes there's an awakening that happens when, when people have babies. Maybe they've been away from the Lord or they've been away from church for a little bit and all of a sudden they have a kid and they're like, oh my goodness, I have to get back to church. This is what's happening to Seth. He's realizing the frailty and mortality of man. Enosh actually means frail, mortal man. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing, God. And all of a sudden, he has a generation that's about to come from him. And he goes, I need to figure this out. And what do I do? He calls on the name of the Lord. Because when you realize there's a generation following your lead, emulating your actions, watching you meticulously, when that weight and responsibility is on you, you will do what Seth did and call on the name of the Lord. When your awareness of your limitations without God are so fierce, understand that you can't do anything without him. You call on the name of the Lord. And this is not just to parents and grandparents in the room. This is not to, just to anybody who has children or who's old enough to have kids or will have kids. This applies to this generation, which is you and I right now, because there's a generation coming and there's a weight and responsibility that needs to be on us to call on the name of the Lord. I was at Overflow all weekend and it was so encouraging to see your students raising up their hands and calling on the name of the Lord. I want every child and movement kids to recognize that they have a God-given purpose in their heart, but that they can't do it without his spirit and come to a place where they just call on the name of the Lord. Amen. To call means to cry out, means to summon to be desperate. Psalm 116 verse two says, because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. Psalm 18 six says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to God for help. Isaiah 58 nine says, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Acts 2 21 says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. As his children, we have his ear. We have his attention. We can call on him and he will answer us. We can call on him when we're lost and we're lonely and we're feeling broken and he will come to us. We call on him. We surrender to him and he will lean close. We call on the name, the name that is higher than any other name, the name that is greater. His name is Yahweh. It's one of authority and immediacy, a presence. When you call on his name, it's synonymous with his presence. He shows up right where you are, right where you need him. You call on him. His name is Abba, which means father. It's an intimate name. It's a covering. It's security, protection, unconditional love. His name is Elohim full of power and might, supreme authority, sovereign over everything, every sunrise, every sunset, every star hanging in the sky, it's because he's holding it together. His name is Jehovah Rapha, my healer. You need healing today. You're going through a dark time, depression, anxiety, fear, maybe in your body, in your mind, disease has overtaken you. He is Jehovah Rapha, he is the healer. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There's nothing before him. There's nothing after him. He's our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace, our mighty God, our wonderful Counselor. He's our Redeemer, our Shepherd, our Savior, our Friend. He is Emmanuel, God with us. We call on the name of the Lord. So here's the difference. Cain's line removed God as supreme ruler and authority. Cain's line ended at the flood. Lamech was the last in that generation, the last of Cain's descendants, and they were wiped out, 
wiped out because judgment is real. Cain's line, Cain's legacy is known from, for rejecting God. But Seth's line called on the name of the Lord. And in Genesis 5, when there's a recap of the genealogy from Adam, Seth is the son that's included. Seth's line goes all the way to Jesus Christ. And when you get on the right line, you're in the direction of Jesus and you're pointing people in the direction of Jesus. Would you stand with me all across this room right now? I believe that we have an opportunity right now that God is revealing how easy it is to be drawn to the wrong line at times. But today is a day of recalibration, a reset. This is your opportunity to get on the right line. Maybe you feel like our friend in London who is being pulled further and further away from us. Maybe you feel far from God and your decisions or your circumstances have made that possible. Today is a day for a reset. All across this room with every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you've wandered. You're doing things contrary to God's design, but today you would say, Natasha, enough is enough. I've been ignoring God's standard. I've been ignoring God's design for my life. I can feel the effects. I can feel that I'm headed to a path of destruction and it's not bringing life to me. I would love the chance to pray for you today. And so in a minute, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to raise your hand. We're not gonna single you out. We're not gonna do anything weird. I just wanna know who I'm praying for. God, we call on you because we need you. We call on you because we're desperate for you. We call on you because our children need you and our schools need you and our workplaces need you and our city needs you. We call on you because we're desperate for breakthrough in our minds, in our bodies, in our families. Right now, if that's you today, you want to take this step and surrender your life to Jesus, invite him into your heart. On the count of three, you can lift your hand. One, two, three. Amazing, amazing. So proud of you, so proud of you. Here in the front, in the middle, incredible. Five more seconds, if that's you today. Would you lift your hand towards heaven? I love it, you can put your hands down. So proud of you. Movement Church, would you say this prayer with me? Repeat after me, dear Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for coming close when I call. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, we're going to sing this song. Let's lift up this song of praise to the Lord. Let's call on his name. Come on, let's sing this together. Say, worthy, say, worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise.
to restore marriages, to restore relationships. There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen, church? Amen. Come on. Man, let me tell you, there is power in the name of Jesus to save. I love that verse that Pastor Natasha put up for us. It says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I just want to celebrate for those people that made that decision today in your heart and in your internal. You just say, Jesus, I choose you. And you just spoke that out today. I just want to encourage you. And we're here for you. We're here for you. And we love you. And we want to walk alongside of you. You know, maybe you made that decision for the first time today to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That is the greatest decision you could ever make. The greatest decision. Come on. Yeah, can we just celebrate for you? Even watching online, I just feel there's just somebody in there and you're just watching this. Maybe later, it's not even live right now, but you're watching this experience and you just feel like you need to make that decision. I want to encourage you, would you make that decision to choose Jesus? Would you make that decision? That's the greatest decision you could ever make. I just want to take a moment and encourage anyone who makes that decision to text the word faith to the number that's on the screen. It'll be in the chat as well. And what this is going to do is get connected with one of our pastor and our pastoral team. And we just want to walk alongside you, like I said, and, and push you into a, a network of people that are just going to build you up. Because you, it's one thing to choose Jesus, and it's amazing. It's the best decision. But we want to encourage you. You don't have to do it alone. Walk alongside other people that want to encourage and strengthen you in your faith. 
But hey, I just want to take one quick moment and, and I just want to honor Pastor Natasha just for sharing today. Can we just take a moment and just celebrate, man, just the amazing things that their ministry is doing. We're just so grateful and blessed to have you in the house today. And we, we're really appreciative of you just bringing the word and speaking what God has put on your heart. So Amen. Good. And if you're struggling with anything else and you just need some prayer, we want you to know we have a prayer team. They'll meet up here in this corner over here, and we would love to pray for you. If there's anything going on, it's not too big for God, and we want to partner together. This is a place not just to go to church, but to belong, but to be family, to receive healing and wholeness, and prayer is a great way to access that. So please come receive prayer if you need it. And if you're online, or if you want maybe more of a private situation, you can text the word prayer to the number on the screen. Our pastors will pray over you during the week, throughout the week, and we'd love to follow up with you, see how it's going, what's going on in your situation. And then one more reminder, next week we have baptisms. This is a powerful, incredible, amazing Sunday where we get to celebrate people saying publicly, I choose Jesus. So please, please show up next week. It's going to be an amazing Sunday, and it's not too late to get baptized. If you are interested, you can go to the guest services out in the lobby, talk to them about baptism, or you can text the word baptism also to the number on the screen. It's the best decision you can ever make. Hey, thank you so much for coming to Movement Church today. I hope you have an amazing Sunday. Say thank you to Pastor Pastor Natasha, if you see her, just bless her for coming today and sharing. We will see you next week. Have an amazing weekend. God bless.